We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Hello, Happy New Year and welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining us for this episode is Aaron Danks. He is a head specialist coach with the English FA and a lead in possession coach. So I followed his journey for a long time online. So really, really excited to have him on. He covers creativity and coaching, innovation, collaboration with staff, player development principles and how to manage change in cultures and environments. Absolutely brilliant conversation. You're going to enjoy this. It absolutely flew by when I spoke to him. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. At Gary Kareen on Instagram. At Gary Kareen on Twitter. Here is Aaron. Enjoy. Aaron, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Really excited to have you on. Thanks, Gary. Nice to be here. Um, really good to speak to you. Really looking forward to it. You've got a, a broad experience in terms of the club's you've worked at and also the roles that you've had with them. So, for example, there was the you setting up the video analysis at West Brom a few years ago. And one of the first questions I want to ask you was, was your take on how important it is for coaches to understand today how these environments work and interact in terms of departments and how each one complements one another? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm in the... A really interesting role at the moment, which I know we'll get into talking about, like a, a specialist coaching role. Um, and a lot of my biases have been, have been in and around that. So people were saying to me, oh, there's, there's a couple of good books out that you should read. And one being Range, which is like uh, the importance of generalists over specialists. So um, I read the book and it's brilliant. Really, really, it's a really great insight in the book around around getting all those experiences um, and having that that range really. So as a as a career coach, as somebody who I've got into coaching at a young age and I've done, done it for twenty years now, and trying to make a career out of it, I think the range of experiences I've had uh, working at all different levels and then working across a few different departments as well. So for example, the video analysis stuff. Um, it gives you an understanding of the, the multidisciplinary approach um, of the ways of working um, and also just the importance of collaborating, really, the importance of making sure we all know the direction that we're heading in, but we can all contribute to get there. Um, and the centre of that always should be the player. So whether it's video analysis, whether it's uh, the sports science or the coaching, whatever whatever department it is we're, we're in, it's... It's really important that we focus. We've got that focus on the player. We've got the focus on getting the best out of the player and developing the players uh, to help the team be successful. Um, and I think that journey that I've been on, the, the diversity of it and, and the different experiences I've had have given me that. How did that role of specialist coach, how did it grow and develop in English football? Yeah, we set up by the FA uh, nearly four years ago now of trying to do something different and trying to think differently about the way that we're working. Um, and not necessarily saying that always just because you do something different, it's going to work and it's going to be it's going to be better. But it was a way of us just going, right, let's look at what we've always done and where can we challenge the norms? Um, it's definitely a never ending evolution. Uh, it's something that's going to constantly keep evolving and keep growing and change and doing things differently is awkward in the beginning really messy in the middle but can be beautiful at the end so we've gone we're going through all that cycle really with the specialist coaching and and, and growing and developing it um for me the, the the kind of the essence of it is just having really clear roles and responsibilities as a coaching team uh, so we've invested in more staff more coaches um and we would have a head coach who would oversee the programme, oversee the more disciplinary approach, um, oversee the managerial and the leadership side of it. And they then have two assistant coaches, one with an in-possession focus and one with an out-of-possession focus, and then the goalkeeping coach as well. Um, and we'd ask those in-possession and out-of-possession guys to just think about how they can work with individuals, units and teams um, 
just to just to just to think differently about how we're coaching. Um, it's been really really fascinating uh, from a human perspective in terms of how humans interact. From a coaching perspective, in terms of almost how we're educated as coaches. So you kind of brought up on the coaching pathway in England to. Um, work with small groups, then develop technical practices into small-sided games. And then as you get higher up, it's about controlling 11 v 11s and uh, having a theme, coaching one team, one theme, and, and being really deliberate about that. And I guess the specialist coaching model is is us tipping that on its head and thinking a little bit differently about how can we get multiple people coaching within, within one exercise? Um, how can we spend more time working with individuals? Um, yeah, so we just just... It's, it's an ongoing process. It's a never-ending cycle and it's just ex- us exploring um, a different way of working. Yeah, you, you mentioned there challenging those norms and about it being messy and a little bit awkward at the start. Was it more awkward with the coach's interpretation of the role or was it more awkward with the players and how they were interpreting it? Where, how did you find that? Yeah, I think the players took to it really, really quickly and in the simplest form, they took to it in terms of uh, clear lines of communication. So they knew exactly in pressurised situations or in, even in relaxed situations of knowing who to turn to quickly for, for advice or for help. So in the heat of a battle, in a half-time team talk, in a in a moment, they can go to, right, I need to speak to the in-possession coach here because I'm having a problem with this or I need to speak to the out-possession coach here because I think I'm, I've got... I've, I've got an issue here. Um, or then even just in relaxed ones, so around the dining room and around uh, breakfast tables and stuff, you just get people coming up to you and players talking to you about a certain aspect of the game because they knew that that was kind of your area of focus. Um, I think the awkward bit was for the coaches. So we had to be a little bit more deliberate about how we plan and how we plan each other into our work. So for us, like the concept of of what of working in silos is dangerous. So an in possession coach just delivering a session on his own, and three or four coaches stood around the pitch with their arms folded, observing him work, uh, is kind of like the the bit that we want to try and avoid. So it's about re- being really deliberate around. This is the session. This is the objective. This is what we get want to get out of it. And it's football, so there's always going to be in possession, out of possession, transition, set plays. There's always going to be everything going on. So your role in this session to to enhance the practice can be this, or your role in the session to get the best of the individuals could be that. Um, yeah, so I, I guess it was a little bit more awkward for the coaches to begin with. I thought it was quite simple and clear for the players, and they took to it quite quickly. You said in your interview with the, the Player Development Project that you want fun and enjoyment to be big drivers in in your environment how does a coach do this at the elite level where there's pressure high standards etc how do you keep enjoyment and love of the game at the forefront yeah my my real succinct quick answer is what's the cost if we don't Mm. so um fun and fun and enjoyment for me can be like the critical difference makers when it comes to the biggest moments of the toughest games. I was really fortunate to go out and on a, on a study visit and go get to see some of the Golden State Warriors environment where Joy is one of their cornerstones of it. And I mean, if you look at the guys when they're warming up, they're warming up to music, they're relaxed, they're, and I'm speaking, I'm then challenging the coaches and speaking to coaches about, come on, what, how do you get these guys to really perform in the biggest moments of the biggest games? And they just talk about, they just love it. They just love being here and they have smiles on their faces. And um, Now, we all know that football is not always smiles. It's not always happy. It's not always, it's not always enjoyable. There's, there's the cutthroat side to football and there's the winning and losing, obviously, to football. Um, but for me, like, love of the game is so important. The best players have it. Um, the best players, I think that's a kind of a bit of a difference maker between the good and the and the, the really good players. They're just that they've just got that love and enthusiasm and want to be there all the time, want to learn, want to get better. Um, and little things that I would always try and do would be to start every session and end every session with smiles. So like a real warm welcome into the practice, make it fun, make it enjoyable. And then no matter what goes on in the session, I know sometimes we want to we let them know that they haven't trained properly, they haven't done well, they haven't 
the session hasn't necessarily gone the way that it, it could have or should have. But if we if we can leave the majority of our sessions with smile, smiles on our faces, I think it has a big impact. And then you create a whole environment around that. Then if you're in a professional club or you're in a uh, an international environment where you're on camp for 10 days, living in each other's pockets, that you've got that social enjoyment factor as well. Uh, just back to my first response, really, what's the cost if we don't? I'm fascinated by this visit with the Golden State Warriors. So yeah. from a leadership standpoint and observing Steve Kerr, I mean, how does how does he facilitate that in an environment where I mean, it's, it's obviously high pressure NBA, but it's pretty like they're, they are in season almost 24 seven. So yeah. know, what's his role throughout that? How did you, how did you see that differently from a premier league coach or, or someone at the highest level in England? Yeah. I mean, the similarities would be my perception of him from, from spending one day in the organization, but also like then studying it from afar, He's very much a leader of culture. He's very much the cultural leader. He, he's outstanding at that. Um, he creates such a good environment for uh, top players to go and perform uh, to their peak. Um, it, it had a big impact on me going in there and seeing it. Uh, a big impact on my coaching. Um, and the fun, the music, the joy bit that we've just spoke about. But also, because of the demands on that sport in terms of... Uh, how dense their games are, how quickly the games come, the, the thick and fast. I think I worked it out last season. They averaged a game every 2.1 days. Um, so game day, the, the real diff points of difference would be game days at like a real work day for them. So they're training, they're coaching, they're uh, doing video analysis clips all on game day. So players are reporting to the venue like three, three and a half hours beforehand. Um, this seems quite consistent across all teams. They're having individual uh, sessions on court on match day uh, and then sandwiched in those sessions are video clips. Uh, this is you in the last game. This is what we're noticing. This is what we think uh, you can do better and they've done well. And this is your opponent you're coming up against tonight. Watch out for this. Look out for that moment. This could be a, this can be a winning move for us. And all that's going on on game day, whereas I think the foot, my experiences of football have been very much, you do a lot of work throughout the week and then game day is like, come off them, let them, let them just focus on their performance and give them little bits, final reminder messages maybe and, and get out. Whereas I've seen top, top athletes being coached um, and sweating and working hard before they've even got into the match. So it was fascinating. Was there anything... In those environments that uh, that you've taken and, and adapted from when England when an England youth team go to a tournament, obviously it's there's so much talk about how poorly England senior teams have travelled. The debacle in in South Africa with boredom and I know Capello thought that the games room was for the kids and it was this whole thing about trying to keep players engaged. I mean, how do you do that when you're away with young players? you know, keeping them loose, keeping them enjoyment, but then getting that working as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the really interesting thing for us is it, it's a totally unique environment. It's so different to being in the club world. So there's there's real, real uh, points of similarity, but there's some massive points of difference as well. So we're waking up with the players um, at eight, nine o'clock in the morning, uh, 10 o'clock if they've got a lie-in. And we're up with them until... They're, they're off in their rooms of an evening. So you've you've got a full day with them and you live in each, in each other's pockets. So the sociable uh, side of it's really, really important that you connect with that quite quickly. Um, we also then recognise two hours of the day is pretty much your training time. So two hours of the day, whether that's a pre-training meeting, a post-training uh, review, uh, and then you're on the grass for however long, depending on your periodisation. So we've been quite deliberate across the whole pathway and across um, from seniors all the way down to our, our youngest age group of 15s about considering the other 22 hours and what that means for the whole multidisciplinary team and how and what that means for the players. So we think that if you if we manage the other 22 hours well and better, it can be a competitive advantage. And that could be things from like, extra teaching time, teaching them off the grass, but it's very much around the social times and how you avoid that boredom and of being away from home and people 
people handle it differently. Uh, in, and that's both in your coaching team and in your, in your multidisciplinary staff and in your players. Um, so being really deliberate about the other 22 hours and maximising the environment, I think, is, is really important. So, yeah, when I'm on my road, when I'm on the road and looking at different sports and looking at different places, um, you get a fascinating, fascinating insight into that. Um, but playful, playful environments, environments where there's games going on. Um, a brilliant. I remember. I remember an England seniors camp at the start of one of the, one of the calendar years, and we had two or three age groups uh, all staying at St George's Park. And there was a little cricket competition going on in one of the corridors with some of the senior lads, some of the under 15s lads. Uh, they all know each other from different club connections and stuff. And there was like a, a mix in, and they were playing cricket in the corridors and. I'm sure a few lampshades maybe got broken, but it, socially it was it was fantastic. Like staying on that connecting with players, Brendan Rogers says that I thought this was great. Uh, it becomes harder for a coach whenever you become older, but the age range that you work with stay the same. How have you evolved or changed, or have you changed anything with connecting to young players uh, that you're working with? Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I mean talk about feeling older i've been coaching now for 20 years uh on monday night i got asked to go and do a grassroots session in a local team in birmingham uh and i was asked to go by a player that i had coached um and i'm halfway through the session and he's asking me a couple of questions about what's going on and and the session and he he just totally randomly out the blue went it's my birthday tomorrow i went oh happy birthday mate he said i'm 30 (laughs) <laughs> it's like, oh my God, so I'm coaching, I'm trying to get make this session that nice and lively for the players. And it's just through that bombshell on me that a lad that I coached growing up, he's his 30th birthday the next day. So it made me feel really, really <laughs> old. Um, how do you stay connected to them? Lots of dad jokes, lots of really, really bad jokes, <laughs> just to show them that you're a human being. Um the one thing I'm struggling with is like the clothing stuff. Like I'm, I'm getting a lot safer with the clothes that I wear and they're getting a lot more radical with the clothes. So I have to take a little bit of the mickey out of that sometimes and uh, show them that. But I think, I think for me, the Brendan Rogers quote, quote about connecting with a person, um, it is so important. So, so important. So regardless of age, um, and it goes back to that range point, really, about about having different coaching experiences and coaching different aged players. And I think it's just about how finding ways to connect with the person first and coaching the person, not just the, the footballer, but connecting with people. Um, it's one of my big values, one of my big, big beliefs and one of my things I'm really passionate about. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it, it does get harder, but I think you've just got to show that and you've got to show them that you, you get that and keep the jokes going and try and connect. Brilliant. And you've looked at a lot of other sports. Uh, we mentioned there the NBA. In terms of specialist coaching, was there any sport that impressed you with how they implemented it and in terms of efficiency? Yeah. The couple of things, the big wow factor for me was like how common it is in almost all sports. So um, I know you're based in Chicago. I flew into Chicago and got to see a ice hockey team work. Um, and even those guys had like a blue liners coach, an attack coach, a goaltenders coach. Um, so it's, it seemed to be really common in all sports. So NFL would be massive just in terms of the, their restrictions on their time that they can practice, that they can hit, that they can tackle because of all the concussion protocol. It was so, so tight. And then on top of that, they've got like a nine inch playbook to teach. So their solution to the problem is, well, every, every three players really need one coach. And so they've gone really position specific, loads of co- lots and lots of coaches, a strong pack of four coaches at the top that are leading the program. And then loads of sp- specialists underneath that are delivering detail um so i think under tight time constraints and we moan about time a lot in football we moan about uh saturday tuesday saturday tuesday games programs we moan about international football that we've only got 10 days we've got three games we've got quick turnarounds um under those time constraints a lot of a lot of other sports have recognized using these coaching models can help them um, I think the guys that were the, probably the most impressive were some of the rugby teams. Um, they seem to be in a really good place around 
uh, I met um, Wayne Smith, the old All Blacks assistant coach, who was a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, morning with him. Uh, and he, he spoke about some of their early mistakes working in silos, um, the boredom of working in silos, not necessarily planning well and, and not necessarily delivering everything that they'd said on paper. And they, they brought, they brought into a concept of like pack coaching. So multiple people delivering within one exercise. Um, I was really lucky to go and spend a day with Eddie Jones with the England rugby team. Um, and they were, they were doing one of their hard training days, one of their chaos days. Um, and the interaction amongst the coaches in the in the session, the deliberate nature of what they were doing, um, but it also afforded them opportunities to go and work um, on specialist coaching scenarios, on problem solving, on developing leadership amongst the players. So it was like one coach is setting a problem, another coach is facilitating a group of players trying to work out what's going on. How we would, how we would defeat that in a game, and it was all under the intensity of a real quick training sessions with real quick turnovers. Like they showed me the session plan to begin with, and it was like we're going to do this for three minutes, that for seven minutes, we're going to do twelve minutes of this, then we'll break off there, do four minutes of that, and then it's going to be. Six. And I was like, oh my god, I've never ever seen a session plan like it. Like in football, we try and be quite logical and go, we've got ninety minutes, we're going to do three sets of twenty minutes, and then a twenty-five thirty minute end game, and. Uh, they were just so random with it. But actually, if you look at the sport and if you look at invasion games, it is unpredictable. It is volatile. It is random. It's like set plays don't come in about of 20 minutes, 15 set plays. They just come random and sporadically. And that's how they practice them. Um, so I thought the rugby guys were in a brilliant place uh, in terms of the work they were doing and, and developing different skills in the players as well. We're just going to take a quick break there. Coaches, if you haven't checked out the Modern Soccer Coach Community platform yet, we have recently uploaded our December webinar, How to Maximize Your Off-Season was the topic. So over 100 minutes of content, interviews, presentations from five Division One college coaches here in the US, Nate Lee, Nicole Van Dyke, Yossi Raz, Chris Rich, Megan Nemzer. They discuss player meetings, recruitment, season reviews, development plans for staff and players and tactical reassessments, how to go about that. So some brilliant insight there. All the webinars are free to the Modern Soccer Coach Community Platform members. It's only $6 a month or you can give it a free try at modernsoccercoach.com slash community. We have over 300 video exercises in there and there's about 20 plus webinars in there as well. So we still have a special offer on the Modern Soccer Coach website for a coaching book and a one-year subscription for only $60. So that's on modernsoccercoach.com slash shop. So thanks for supporting it. Back to Aaron. Talked about relationships there and an interesting point about the staff and the, the collaboration and the preventing silos. So how important is it that the staff, I suppose, uh, formally, informally, socially, understand each other get together how does that work do you spend a lot of time together or is that at all formal meetings or what's the process there yeah i mean the the, the rugby guys in particular like the planning was meticulous i sat in on the training view a training review and it was so challenging and, and they really pushed each other to 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 say come on did we really get what we wanted to get today was we clear did we get clarity was the task relevant? They, they really, really pushed each other, and it was it was it was fantastic. Um, bringing that back to my experiences and my world now is, it's, again, it's a unique environment. So we've got coaches that live all different corners of the country. Previously, when I worked at West Brom, everyone lived in a similar area. Friday afternoon, you could go and have a a, a beer or a social and and put the world to right and go again and. Um, it's been harder to do that in the international world. However, you're then living together on camp. So for those 10 days, you're together. And I mean, one of our smallest programs would be probably a 50 day calendar year. One of our bigger programs, like a, a major tournament, the year 2017, we was at a world cup. It was, I think we were together for like 75, 80 days of the year that you're living together in each other's pocket. 
Um, and that's, by the way, that's exaggerated loads more in other sports. I know the uh, women's senior team, they, they have a lot more days together on the road. Um, so it's those moments that are really important. It's that just chewing the fat and and building trust, building building rapport with each other, spending time together um, in the evenings around your planning, around your making some of your some of your environments where you've got to do some serious work. Make them make them. You don't always you don't always have to. Uh, to be serious to do the serious stuff so it's making some of those environments nice and relaxed television coffee machine mm. um and then we're sitting down and we're planning we're talking about players we're doing stuff so there's always stuff going on but it's in a relaxed environment we're building the building that rapport because we know when we get out on the grass it's got to be slick it's got to be we've got to be really clear and confident in what we're doing and how and how we're delivering each other and how we're challenging each other on the grass as well and so to to benefit the players yeah, you mentioned that nine-inch uh, playbook in, that the football yeah. players get. Now, going back to that and, and merging coaching styles, very command-led football is. So mm-hmm. when you're specialist, you obviously have a clear, and you said there, concise way of putting something out. How much space is there then or how difficult it is to balance then? Is there a certain style that you want to have as a, as a staff or does that depend on the coach? Yeah, we we know that um, we know that diversity can be a competitive advantage for us as well. So having difference and having different thinking in our thinking, um, divergent thinking, and this is the thing I always struggled with with like teaching styles and learning styles. And I know that there's some real good value to it, but I would hate to think that my daughter went to school and was only taught one way ever. I just think it's really restrictive. It's not exposing her to what she needs. And there's going to be certain lessons that she really engages with and really, really likes. And there's going to be certain styles that she really likes and she's going to learn loads from. There's going to be other bits that she's going to find difficult. But I think they're also developing skills in her that are really important. So um, we kind of we kind of want a freedom within a framework. So we kind of kind of want to say to our coaches that, yeah, listen, there's some things that we're going after here and there's some ways of working as a, as a federation that we think are going to be unique and are going to be uh, not right for everybody, but going to be trying to help our players achieve what they want. But within that, there's still going to be scope for you to come and express yourself and be authentic and be genuine to yourself as a coach. Um, and that's really, really important to me because um, we don't want robots. We want humans and, and, and that's always the way, the way it's going to be with humans. Talent needs perspective. Love this. Can you can you elaborate on it? Yeah, yeah. So again, it was uh, one of my big takeaways from some of the cultures looking at different organisations, and I I had a saying uh, and quite a dangerous saying really growing up. I heard it somewhere, and typical young coach nicked it, liked it about talent needing trauma. And about uh, if you looked at the pathways of top, top athletes, they'd gone through some kind of setbacks in their life. And um, and it was like, OK, well, what about the athlete that hasn't? What about the player that hasn't? Am I going to just expose them to some trauma for the sake of exposing to some trauma? And as I've matured and as I've, as I've um, kind of developed a bit more emotional intelligence, really, thinking about it as perspective, so talent needing perspective, um, there's a massive entitlement culture in football. There's a massive culture of the best players get given the best contracts, get given boot deals, get told by lots of people that they're doing well. Um, and that's the same in, in, in many walks of life. If you're really good at something, you get the biggest rewards for it. So this entitlement culture, um, it, can, it can be a limiting factor if we're not careful. It can, it can really hinder our top, top players. So how do we challenge entitlement? How do we challenge players that get too much too soon? Um, and and the science behind it, like the the young player's brain, the emotional intelligence and the, the ability to be empathetic is some of the last things that you develop in your brain and some of the last, um, the last skills that we formalise. So I think it's really, really important for our players that we can we can provide them opportunities for perspective. We can give them an understanding of what, of of what their role is and be mindful of what your role is and be mindful of 
the brilliant experiences, the brilliant exposure you're going to get, the brilliant opportunities you're going to get in life. Um, but having perspective to that, having perspective of of the the obviously the they've got it really tough in terms of social media. They've got it really tough in terms of. Uh, influence they'll be judged quicker than anybody else our young top players will be put on a pedestal and the moment they take one step out of line they'll be knocked down and um, so we've got to give them real perspective on it uh, some of the great work that I've seen done be around uh, getting uh, role models coming in speaking to them getting ex-players coming in speaking to them we had a, a goalkeeper who went out to World Cup um, and played minimal minutes to, to zero minutes, come in and talk to the group about what it was like to be a traveller, what it was like to, to be in that position. Um, I, I've known sports where they've got, um, or even previously in my role at West Brom, where um, we had some of our black players who had gone through horrendous racism and horrendous experiences in the 80s, early 90s, come in and talk to our players about what that felt like, what that was, and almost the pain that they've had to go through to afford our players now. And I know it still goes on. And I know you've seen some things coming out in the media at the moment, which are horrific. I saw a newspaper article from Italy yesterday. I'm like, this got to be photoshopped. It can't be real. Um, but to, to give our players perspective on what's gone before them, what's the people that have gone through some, some real pain and some real difficulty um, to afford them the experiences that they get now. And I know we're still on that journey and I think we've got a massive role to play in, in, those, in those points of perspective. And I think there's some, some brilliant work going on, by the way, some, some top players. I mean, Raheem, some of the work that Raheem Sterling's done to shine a light on it and to... Uh, to bring it to the forefront is absolutely fantastic. So yeah, talent definitely needs, for me, needs perspective and it needs to, to manage the entitlement and the too much too soon, but also recognising in society, we play a massive, a big, big role uh, and we've got a big role to play with that. The youth of today, staying on that there, a lot of coaches over here struggle with players in leadership roles. And I know you talked about coaches facilitating peer learning. Uh, yes. What What are some ways they can do that? I think you've got to create a really, really, uh, a really good environment for it, but a really safe environment for it. And that, that psychological safety of a coach asking a question and asking really good questions. So I think it's, a, it's an art form. It's a real skill. And I'm constantly trying to get people that can help me. Uh, so we have some psychologists that we work with in, within the organisation. And whenever I'm delivering, I always say to them, what was my question like? How, how could I have asked better questions? And um, So if we ask a really good open question and then pause the room and wait for the silence and be comfortable holding that silence if we need to, that first person that responds in the room, they they metaphorically need a hug. They need, they metaphorically need to be told that's brilliant. That's really, it's a really safe place to say these things. And then before we, we, we really quick as coaches to come in with our knowledge, with our detail, with our, um, with our expertise, I think it's really important. We bounce that player's idea around the room. So let's bounce that round some of his peers and round some of his players uh, around some of the players in the room. So uh, we'd ask a question. We'd say, this is a problem you could face. What solutions might you come up with? Right, we could play it from the back by finding our fullback in a high wide position. Right, what do you think about that as a fullback? What does that mean for you? Okay, but I might be a little bit worried about their fullback coming and closing me down. Okay, who might help them with that? And so we'd bounce that around the room a little bit and get them coaching each other, get them understanding each other's ideas before we then come in with clarity as the coaches at the end. Um, some of the other stuff that we've done around peer-to-peer -peer learning, own, the word ownership gets branded around a lot in, in sport and in football. And I don't think there's many athletes I've, I've seen, experienced, read about, watched around the world who can really take ownership of, of, of something. I think there's there's certain levels and degrees degrees to it. So let me give you some examples. So, um, 
the cyclist in, in England, Chris High, uh, unbelievable athlete, unbelievable perform, performance. What a career! Uh, he's won so much, and I I would presume and predict that in the final year or two of his career, he was that well attuned and he knew him body, his body that well that he could take ownership of his program to say. These are the days I'm training. This is how long I'm training for. I need this from the, my nutritionist. I need that from my psych. I need this from here. And he could manage his, his, manage his team around him. Now, in a team sport, that, that dynamic, again, would be bonkers to even think about. So I think when we talk about giving people ownership, we've got to be really, really careful about what we mean. So ownership for me and peer-to-peer coaching for me has looked like we give them some principles We do a lot of work on getting their belief and buying into those principles. And then we give them some tools or some common language that they can use to talk about. So an an example would be we spoke about goal scoring with with a set of players. We, we, We put the goal scoring on a scale of one to nine. So a nine would be a real clear cut golden goal scoring chance. And a one would be a real difficult, challenging finish. We said there was no zero because you can score from anywhere at any time. And there's no 10 because you can miss anything at any time. But we're going to use this scale of one to nine. So the players are looking at me going, right, what's he going on about here? He's, uh, he's a lunatic again. So I put some video clips on of some goals and some, and some misses and some chances. I said, right, I'd rank this as a nine because you're unopposed. You're really close to the goal. You're on your strong foot. You're in balance. Boom. It's a, it's a, it's a real clear cut chance. And the players go, yeah, yeah, get it. This one here is is unbalanced. He's he's got a defender with his arm and his neck. He's like right on top of him. He's off balance. He's on his weak foot. He's kind of side onto the goal. He's trying to spin and hit it. It's a real difficult finish. It's like a three or a four. He's twenty yards out. It's a it's a real difficult moment. And the players go, yeah, okay, I get it. So. I've given them some principles. I've given them a little bit of belief in what we're doing. So we then play a game. It comes after the game. We put the clips on and we put on our goal scoring chances. Straight away, somebody has a shot on goal. I say, right, what score would you give yourself? For that? What, what, where would you put that on the scale? And they go, ah, oh, that's, that's probably a seven. And somebody in the corner of the room goes, that's not a seven. That's a five. That's really difficult. Straight away. They, they, I just get out of the way now and just let those two talk, talk it out. So they're going, well, why, why do you think it's a five? Um, he's under pressure there. He's, he's, he ain't got much time and space. That's a difficult finish. Or it could be the flip flip side of it that somebody goes, yeah, that was probably a, four, uh, that was probably a, a six, really. That was different. And, and somebody else in the room went, no, nah, I've seen you score that goal loads of times. You're, you're good enough to do that. And um, we had one, one, one lad went through on his left foot. He's on the corner of the 18-yard box. So he's on quite an angle, quite a tight angle. And he strikes it with his left foot across goal and it goes over the bar. And I said to him, what score would you give yourself there? And he went, I'm really disappointed with my execution. He said, that's a, that's a, uh, it's a, it's a six or a seven, but I've got to do better. I've got to hit the target. I've got to, I've got to make sure I'm hitting the corners. And he was really honest, really reflective. The big dopey centre back at the back back of the classroom who, who just piped up and he went, "Yeah, that's a six or a seven for you. But if you roll it across the box there to the centre forward, that's an eight or a nine for him." And it was such a simple coaching point and one that I we'd all seen in the video clip and one that we I as a coach could have delivered. But the fact that it was a peer delivering the message to one of his peers, it just had such so much more of an impact on the group. Uh, and it was such a better moment than it coming from the coach and not always from the coach. And there'd be some examples. Can you talk about the the clarity to chaos continuum and how that works whenever you're planning the sessions? Yeah, how long we got? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a it's a real area of passion for me. Um, it's something that I stumbled across in in my own coaching and in my own thoughts and. It's organisationally grown a little bit of legs and, and we're trying to think about how we can use it to just have better conversations about our coaching. So Clarity to Chaos Continuum, um, reading Dennis Bergkamp's book, Stillness and Speed, a fantastic book, really good insight into him as a player and his background. And uh, He spoke about playing for two different coaches. Both of them wanted the exact same game style, uh, the Dutch 4-3-3. 
One of them was really, really structured. So Louis van Gaal really structured and deliberate in the way that he was delivering it. And Cruyff allowed for a little bit more freedom, a little bit more insight. Um, both top coaches, both going for the same game style, but both delivering it in a really different way. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. Where, where would I sit on that? And if it was a spectrum of one to the other, where would I put myself? Um and I, I was watching coaches work and I was watching people and I was thinking, right, you get, I get your game style. I get what you're going after. Uh, and some people were doing it for real structure and uh, clarity and um, strategy, almost like the NFL playbook. And others were going for more room for freedom, creativity, and let them express themselves, let the game be the teacher and the other end of the spectrum. So um, I kind of like in my head devised a bit of a model and went, right, I don't want to be one without the other. I want to have a nice blend to my coaching where I can give them a bit of structured stuff because I think it's important, but I can also expose them to the game and allow them freedom to solve problems and work things out. Um, So the fallout of all that was, I think you can go and watch pretty much any coach in any invasion sport and it, you could use this model and consciously or unconsciously that have made a decision when they're coaching, they're either coaching clarity or they're coaching chaos. So a clarity coach would be an environment that's really, that can be really coach led uh, and the environment supports that. And there's some really good work going on and the coach is giving them really clear messages either to the individual, the unit or the team around This is what the team needs to look like. This is what we need to do. This is the problem we're going to face. And this is our solutions to get to it. The the chaos end of the spectrum would be more around. It's not pure chaos. It's not it's not like chaos in terms of totally random and sporadic. For me, it's chaos in terms of it's, it's like the game. It's volatile. You've got a game plan. You've got a way of playing. This is what you want to happen. But what, happen when, what happens when that goes wrong? What happens when teams stop that from happening or teams do something different? And developing this end of the, the spectrum for me is developing the players to, to thrive in those moments. It's developing the players who can self-organise, who can be aware and work out what's going on and can, can respond in the heat of battle. Now, coaches need to be able to do that as well, but it's about empowering the players to do a little bit of that. So um, a chaos session for me would be more environment-led, coach-supported. So the coach would be ready in the background to facilitate and offer a bit of support and would create a really good environment of problems and letting the players work out what's going on. Um, And I just think deliberately, consciously or unconsciously, we 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 we're in that every day as a coach, uh, and we're we're trading off with ourselves every day. Uh, and if I was to ask a young coach, a young me, what is coaching? I'd have definitely been at the clarity end of the spectrum. I'd have definitely. I remember seeing a video clip of Pep Guardiola coaching in Doha at a warm weather training camp with Bayern Munich. Um, Pep's in red gear. He's bouncing around the pitch. The players are static. The players are listening. His enthusiasm, his, his, his attitude, his work, his detail is unbelievable. And I'm going in my head, that's screaming out at me like, this is world-class coaching. This is where I need to strive towards. This is where I need to get to. Um, and I, I, my biases as a young coach would have been around the clarity stuff, would have been around coach's king and coach's knowledge and I've got to disseminate that knowledge and listen Peps like he still is a massive role model he still is like one of the best um out there the chaos end of the model is is actually like my ego as a coach has to take a little bit of a back step here for a moment and has to has to go right I've got to coach differently now I'm not going to be front and center I'm not going to be telling the players the solutions I might have to just I might just have to step back, create an environment, see what they do, and then explore that with them afterwards. Like I said, personally, I don't want to be one without the other. I want to have a nice blend, and I think what we're trying to do with our England teams is talk about right in the in under the constraints of international football, uh, how do we get that balance right? What does that look like in terms of periodization? 
Uh, and what impact does that have on the on the physical, on the social, on the psychological framework? Um, and I, I think it gives us just some real clear, simple language to explore some real complex ways of ways of working. Last one, and kind of links back to the to the first question where we talked about your role in at West Brom starting up the analysis department. Um, what's the role of analysis? I'm curious to see what it is with your role today, and do you complement your work with data and the scouting end of it? Yeah, um, I think it's a really, really interesting, um, a really interesting point in football uh, in terms of this data explosion. Um, so, specialist coaches for us that are analysts. So, all of our specialist coaches are sports code trained. So, we are laptops, clips, training, games, opposition analysis. We're clipping. We're coding. We're building uh, movie organizers and databases to share with staff and players. Um, so we're doing a lot of that analysis work um, and we think it's really important in a plan do review process. It's really important in terms of reviewing um, and creating a culture of we want to learn, we want to get better, we want to share, we want to talk to our players. Um, so we're doing that side and what that's allowed our on the ground analysts to do is to be a bit more data driven so they can go away and they can measure the game in a bit more of a clinical manner so for the following morning after a game i turn up i've got my clips from the game against the game plan i go right this is what i saw this is what i thought we did well this is where i thought the game plan worked this is where the players tried something different and i want to find out why and blah 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 blah. so I, i turn up my clips there and the analyst's role now is to is to check and challenge that so not to come through the same lens that i'm coming from it's for him to come in and go, well, actually, the data says this um, or that or whatever it is. Um, and we just, we're just we just really exploring that now. So it's kind of opening Pandora's box, really. And we're kind of going, wow, there's so much here. Um, and I think the role of it moving forward be, will be the ability to quickly decipher that. I think the teams that can get into that data, decipher it, visualise it so it adds impact the quickest, we'll, we'll, we'll get an advantage. Um, and then off camp, there's, there's big stuff for us as well in terms of research projects, modern day tactical trends, what's going on in the game from a coach's lens, from a data perspective. And then also um, we've got a talent insights team at the FA who are analysing our players and watching our players. So we're on, constantly out on the road, watching players, scouting, visiting clubs, looking at how they're doing. And our data team in the background of that are also measuring it and looking at um, effective actions, who's doing what, how their performances are in the game. So uh, I think we're at really a, a birthplace of opening Pandora's box and seeing what it all means. I think it's um, it's definitely there to to check and challenge our coaching perspe- perceptions. And for me, I think that can only be a good thing um, as long as we don't drown in it and as long as we don't get lost in it and as long as the coach, uh, we we still bring it back to that human, the human values and the human things that we spoke about earlier in the in the podcast um, is really important. But I think this, this can give us a, a deeper insight. So yeah, it's exciting times. Brilliant. Aaron, thank you so much. No, thank you. I can't thank you enough for, for getting you on, and, and that insight was absolutely fantastic. Gary, thank you, and keep up the good work. There's some, some brilliant work going on, so uh, I really enjoy listening to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much to Aaron for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I could have talked for hours there. Just find that fascinating how you go from open-minded, from, again, theory to practice, where... We all like to think we're open-minded and that we listen to new ideas, but going above that is challenging norms and then applying change and applying new ideas and then committing to new ideas. Uh, Because when you're working at the level that that he's working at, the the professional players in England and the English national team levels, you can't just try out one or two things every time the players come into camp. You have to continually work at them, improve them, stick to them, and the detail that he showed in the planning and the efficiency and 
things like preventing silos and how deliberate they were about the type of environment that they wanted to create, I thought was absolutely brilliant. I was really inspired by how he went away and looked at different sports. It's been a topic on a couple of conversations with coaches about how open-minded they are and it's something that I've always regretted whenever I've worked alongside different sports in college. So I thought that was brilliant. The biggest takeaway from me though was all this change, all these new innovations, really exciting stuff, but underneath all of that or at the forefront of all of that or the foundation or wherever it is, those values of fun and enjoyment and it's clear that the players are always at the centre of what they're doing and that question where you know how do you get that fun how do you get that enjoyment and his answer what's the cost if we don't I thought that was absolutely fantastic and again inspiring that even though you have these forward thinking environments and and so much change and so much interesting and exciting things happening that these values of enjoyment and and putting the player first and relationships they're so important and they're still at the forefront of what they're doing so it's great to hear an insight like that there from Aaron and I really appreciated him coming on and it's also then probably no secret that England are are really really doing well at the youth levels and the Premier League and players coming through and the things that they're doing, I think we can all take some ideas on board and not just of new things we're doing, but how to improve current processes as well. So we'd love to know your thoughts on that. As always, at Gary Cronin on Instagram, at Gary Cronin on Twitter. Before you go, please leave your annual review for the podcast if you haven't done one in a while a five star rating a little bit of what you think of it would be really really appreciated just to spread the word as we approach the new year so thanks so much we've got a couple of great podcasts on the way really excited about some things coming up in 2020 let me know if i can help in any way gary at modernsoccercoach.com thank you so much for listening have a great week goodbye Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.